Hello. Good evening. Wow. That was high pitched. Um, welcome. My name is Emily Summer. I am the book buyer here at East City Bookshop. Um, and it's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. If you have never been here before, we extend an, a special welcome and we hope that you will come back and see us. Please follow us on social media and check our events calendars for other events such as this. Um, we only send out our e-newsletter once a week, so if you don't already subscribe, that is a great way to stay informed as well. We are also delighted that this event is being streamed virtually tonight for people joining at home. So if everyone watching on Zoom webinar, we are very glad that you're here as well. Before we get to tonight's conversation, a couple of housekeeping notes. There will be time for audience questions at the end of the conversation, so please hold your questions until then. And we're in a small enough space that if you're here and you ask a question in person, we will not have a microphone. We'll ask that you just speak up and then we'll ask Lee or Laura to repeat the question so that our Zoom audience is fully in the loop. If you need a bathroom, it's upstairs past our cash register and greeting cards. And most importantly, if you still need a copy of a likely story, we have signed copies upstairs as well. There will be time for personalization if you'd like a personalization after the event. And now for the reason that we're here. Lee McMullen Abramson has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, Tablet Magazine, and more. She grew up in New York City, the daughter of a children's author and an illustrator. Lee's parents often collaborated on picture books, many based on Lee's own childhood experiences. She studied ballet at the School of American Ballet into her teens, but eventually rebelled against her artistic family by going to law school. She practiced law for several years before following her passion for writing. Lee now lives in New York City and Vermont with her husband and two young children. A Likely Story is her first novel, and Kirkus says that it crafts a universal story about family, dreams, and the stories that linger long after we're gone. Publishers Weekly calls it a clever debut that lands as a thoughtful meditation on family. I was drawn to it because I love anything about the elite literary scene in New York particularly when the book is as inventive and well-drawn as this one. In conversation with Lee tonight is a writer that we count as our, our friend, Laura, Laura Hankin. Laura's official publisher bio says that she is the author of Happy and You Know It and A Special Place for Women. Her musical comedy has been featured in publications like the New York Times and the Washington Post, and she is developing projects for film and TV. She lives in DC where she once fell off a treadmill twice in one day. That's the official publisher copy. I did not add that part. But as an unofficial aside, I will say that for East City Bookshop's purposes, our unofficial bio of Laura is that she's our Capitol Hill neighbor and a dear friend of the store. Yes, bookstores can have friends. Laura's novel, The Daydreams, will be published on May 2nd, and I can tell you in my not very humble opinion that it is her best book yet. We are thrilled to have Lee and Laura here with us tonight. Thank you both, and welcome, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for that intro, Emily. Um, well, first of all, congratulations. You're a few weeks into publication now, right? Yes, about almost a month. How has it been? It has been great. It's been really exciting to finally have the book in the hands of readers and not just on my laptop or, you know, the family members I foist it upon. <laughs> um, how have the family reactions been? <laughs> They have been really good. Um, you know, my husband read a very rough draft a long time ago, and he told me that this one was much, much better. So that that's good. <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't worse. Um, yeah. And I had like a very, um, you know, honest conversation with my father-in-law when he told me that he related to the, one of the male characters, Brian, who, um, you know, has a friend that he's sort of in love with. And my father-in-law told me that that used to happen to him all the time. Wow. <laughs> so, so, you know, you just think things are revealed. Yeah. You never know what you you're going to learn about you people through your own books. Um, well, I know you had said that maybe you would read a little bit, sure. right? Um, yeah. But before you do, could you give us just a quick little yes. synopsis of yes. what the book is? 
So the book follows Isabel Manning, who is the daughter of an iconic novelist, Ward Manning, and she is trying to follow in his footsteps very unsuccessfully at the beginning of the book. She is 35. She has not yet published the novel she's been working on for many years, and her mother has just died. So things are not going well for her. Um, Shortly after her mother's death, she goes out to her parents' house in Sag Harbor in Long Island to spend a weekend with her father, uh, which is awkward because he has never really been the primary parent in her life, even though she reveres him. Uh, And after this weekend, uh, she does publish a book to, you know, great success, but her real troubles are only just beginning. (laughs) (laughs) so i will read something at the very start pretty pretty early in the book um because otherwise it might be confusing um this is after isabel's mother's claire's memorial service um and she is at her parents apartment Isabel went into the kitchen and poured the remainder of a bottle of wine into her glass, then turned out all the downstairs lights. The house was quiet, nothing to suggest what had just occurred, save a doughy alcohol smell and the subtle vibration that hung in the air like a bell recently rung. She walked up the stairs to the second floor of the duplex and saw a light emanating from the door of her father's study. Ward often read over his work late into the night. It was both ridiculous and completely unsurprising that her father would maintain his routine today. When Isabel was growing up, her father stayed in the office all day, the methodical click of the old school typewriter, the only proof of life. Long ago, he'd added a bathroom and he'd outfitted the room with a bar and a mini fridge so that human needs would not draw him out of his private world. Her mother warned Isabel not to make too much noise or knock or, God forbid, try to enter. So Isabel would leave her father books she made with crayons and folded paper outside the door for him to find. The next day at breakfast, Ward would give her his critique. He'd always taken her seriously as a writer. He'd even had one he'd even had one of Isabel's crayon books framed and hung at Couture's, a French bistro that displayed the books of local writers. Ward had his own section. A placeholder for your real book, he'd said. Isabel found it amusing until her real book never came and was secretly relieved when the restaurant closed. Isabel now paused at the top of the stairs before gingerly approaching her father's door. The study had a hallowed vibe and a still forbidden fruit element. One night in high school, Ward and Claire away in Sag Harbor, Isabel invited a group of friends over. Feeling the evening was taking a turn toward boring and noticing a lot of people checking their beepers, Isabel suggested they all take a tour of her father's office. Luckily or unluckily, the door was unlocked and Isabel blithely walked in like she did it all the time. She showed off pictures of her her father and his famous friends, Tina Brown, Julian Schnabel, Patrick McMullen. They all made themselves comfortable underneath Ward's life-size old master rendering of Napoleon charging into battle. But quickly, a choking feeling took hold of Isabel, as if there was not enough air in the room. She attempted to usher her friends away, but having gained entry into the sanctum, they would not be lured back out. Instead, they took books from the shelves and left them strewn all about the room for Isabel to clean up later. A boy from Collegiate, one Isabel would later take to prom and have regrettable sex with, started a discussion about who was superior, Ward or Tom Wolfe. It was just jokes at the beginning, but then her friends, coddled budding intellectuals, started arguing seriously ignoring Isabel as if her father's fame made him fair game for a no-holds-barred academic discussion in front of her. When the group came down on the side of Tom, Isabel clearly intuited that it wouldn't be cool to be offended, and she realized she wasn't exactly. Surprise morphed into secret, dangerous pleasure that her father did not universally reign supreme. Yay! (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, I feel like that's such the writer's dream to be able to have your own study with your own bathroom in oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in New York City. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that is a dream. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, I am so interested to hear how this book came about for you and what prompted the idea. I did not realize until Emily was reading your bio that your parents were writers as well. Yes. Um, well, my parents, um, my father's an artist and a writer. My mother writes children's books. So I definitely grew up in a creative household, though my parents don't resemble the parents in this story. Yeah. Um, so, but I did grow up around a lot of like kind of art successful artistic you know, egos. So some of that did make its way into the book and some of these characters. And I was always interested in writing about a family story and family dynamics. So, and, you know, I had my own frustrations as an unpublished author that, you know, also made their way into this book. So, <laughs> um, you know, it started off as a story about a daughter and a father and a mother who all had their own kind of creative aspirations and, and sort of how they were experienced very differently by three members of the same family. Yeah. And the interplay between the three family members is so good and surprising. And I really enjoyed this book. I read it a few months ago and then I was rereading it in preparation. I was like, oh, so good. Oh, <laughs> um, you. But, you know, I think it's interesting. You hit on a topic that became very popular in the past six months um, with this book, which is the Nepo baby. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for people who aren't maybe as chronically online as I am, mm -hmm. um, nepotism babies are the children of famous parents who end up going into the same field and having success. And there was like a real backlash a few months ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually think being a Nepo baby or being someone who be could be considered a Nepo baby is probably really difficult. And I think Isabel, the character in this book, is certainly tortured by the fact that she, you know, is definitely in her father's shadow and there's very little she can do to change that. And, you know, anything she does where she does well, people will say, well, you know, discount her success because, well, I'm sure she got that because of her father and anything where she fails, people will be like, oh my God, she failed. And she has a famous father. It's sort of like she can't win and everything sort of, you know, will go back to the famous parent. So I really feel like it's somewhat torturous. And if if I could give Isabel advice, I'd say like, go be a doctor or something where, you know, uh, people might not have heard of your father, but then I guess that we'd have no book. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> we have to make her miserable. Right, exactly. <laughs> For the literature of it all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought you had a very like nuanced portrayal of the struggle of, of it all, because it is so easy to say like, how dare you complain? You had everything right. handed to you, all the connections, but you're right that it comes with its own struggles too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I was actually trying to think of like, there are so many Nepo babies in Hollywood, um, but I couldn't really think of any in publishing. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. <laughs> oh, Emily. Yes. Emma Straub. Oh, true. Emma Straub. Right. And she yeah. has like proved her, her right. talent and her worth right. many times over. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm just wrong. <laughs> yeah. Interesting right. that he uses a different last name though. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's probably not as much in the publishing world, but it's yeah, I guess it's not it's everywhere. Yeah. But I feel like in the publishing world you have to like you have to write a whole book. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. True. Which Very is it's true. hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think another thing that you do very well in this book is you write characters that some people might consider, quote unquote, unlikable, mm -hmm. um, but you make the readers really root for them or at least root for them to be redeemed. <laughs> right. Um, and I was so curious as to how how you balanced that. And like when you're writing them, are you thinking of them as unlikable? Um. I, well, 
I actually, <laughs> I like writing about flawed characters and even characters that I guess veer into the unlikable space and make bad decisions because I find them to be the most interesting. Um, and as long as I can find a way to have some empathy for them, then I think, I hope the reader will too. So, you know, for Isabel, I tried to show that it wasn't really like so amazing having a famous parent all the time and that it was probably psychologically difficult for her and for her father ward who's also a pretty difficult character you know i tried to show a side of him that he was actually sort of like a lonely and you know fame obsessed person which caused him to neglect a lot of aspects of his life mm -hmm. and to see him, you know, to see him in a way that where you were like, oh, it might not actually be that fun being you either. So I try to find a way to look at like the other side of the character that's more, you know, if not likable, then empathetic. Yeah, for sure. And for Ward and Isabel too, I mean, the huge thing hanging over the present day of the book is that they're grieving like yes the loss of this person who's been such an anchor for right both of them. yes yes true yes they're both in very difficult positions when the book opens they're not they're certainly not on a high though you know <laughs> it's not as if things won't get worse for them but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but who wants to read a book where things just like slowly get better? And better? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you also write from the perspective of a few different characters throughout the book. It switches mm -hmm. between four, right? Am I forgetting? Um, yeah. Yeah, four. Um, <laughs> was one of them more fun to write? Uh, did any of them have challenges in particular? Um. I, you know, I enjoyed writing all of them and I do like the variety of being in different people's heads. I actually found Claire, who's the mother, to be more challenging to write because she's less flawed. So that's, for me, almost harder. Um, I enjoyed writing Brian, who is the sort of friend, almost boyfriend character. And he, I think, is kind of like the stand-in for the reader. And he's the one who's sort of able to be like, these people are actually like very like warped and have these views that you can only think are normal if you're in this very rarefied, like literary New York world. Right. But if you're in that world, they are gospel. <laughs> right. But yeah. he's not. So he's like, this is strange. So it was kind of fun to be able to have his perspective on, you know, the the family. Yeah. Did you think about including other perspectives? Like, did you try writing chapters from other characters' points of view? Like additional characters? Yeah. yeah no. More than the four. No. <laughs> you didn't want to no. do like 17. No, no. I think, well, then I, there's also a book within the book. So there's that also. And that, yeah. So that, I guess, is the fifth ish. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about that because I, I personally am like always terrified to include <laughs> this book within the book is a good book in the world of the book. And yeah. also in our world, it is good and fun to read as well. Yeah. But I feel like whenever I write something where the characters are like, what a great song, what a great line. Yeah. I have a panic attack <laughs> having to yeah. actually write it out and try to just skip as much of it as possible. Um, So I was so impressed that you like dove in and gave us a bunch of this book. Oh. Well, I, I definitely tried to avoid it for a long time. I wrote a, a, you know, a few drafts of this book and I thought it was done in February of 2020. I was like, I think this book is done. You know, I'm ready to like move on to the phase of where try to sell it. And, and then COVID happened and basically like everything obviously shut down. And I, at that point I was like, I don't, I don't know that I'll ever finish or publish this book. And it was just doing zoom school. My son was five and my daughter was two. So I just, I just stopped writing altogether really. And then my kids were in school again, like six months later in September. And I had some time. I went back to the book and I read it 
over. And I realized that if I was going to talk about this book that was so great that I had to put it in, in, but it was definitely something I was resistant to yeah. because I was like, it's just better if I tell them it's amazing. Trust me, <laughs> but that's really not fair to the reader. So, so then it took me another probably six months to like work that in. I'm very slow at writing. So, <laughs> yeah, but it took me several months to like weave that in and write those chapter, write those like snippets. Yeah. Did you map out like that whole book and sort of do a mini writing version of the whole thing? I definitely didn't write the whole book, but I had to, I did have a separate document that just had those parts so that they would kind of flow together and make sense. Like that, you know, I, I think I actually did the math that if it was like a 350 page book that like, I don't remember each snippet should essentially like jump ahead every like 30 pages or, Mm -hmm. you know, 40 pages. So like kind of feeling like that was the right, like amount of space. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it funny? The stuff that you do as an author that you like become very obsessed with. (laughs) We were like, yes, I'm doing the math of this. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, I also wanted to ask, you know, you wrote this book about the publishing industry and people who are very involved in the publishing industry. Um, But this was your debut novel, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So I guess, you know, how did you do that research and make it feel so real? Because it did feel very real um, and detailed. And then now having gone through uh, the publication process, is there anything that you're like, I wish I had included this detail. This is wrong. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I didn't really do that much research. I mean, I felt like I kind of under like stood some things just from like you know my own observations and then like my parents you know they were in the children's space but I I did grow up hearing like words like galley and like Mm -hmm. editor you know I I felt like I had some sense of what was going on I I had to play around with it obviously because like in the timeline she publishes the book very quickly Like, it's like she goes from, you know, finishing this book and then it's published, I think, like four months later or something. So obviously that is not realistic. So, you know, and I, there was a reason for it in the book that it was so fast, but something like that obviously would be different in real life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I guess I I would have more detail probably to add now about how, but I'm not sure it would have made the book better. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think it might've actually just been sort of, you, you don't want to go too inside baseball. Yeah. The readers aren't clamoring yeah. for more minutia about right. the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I have some more questions I can ask you, but I don't know if we should open it up to audience Q and A. Perfect. Um, well, I would love to hear a little bit more about your writing routine besides the fact that you are apparently slow. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I generally will try to write as much as possible in the morning. That doesn't always happen. I used to wake up very early and write from like five to seven. And then once I had a second child that just didn't really work anymore. (laughs) And now, yeah. Yeah. So I try not to be precious about writing. So if I have, you know, even half an hour, I'll start looking at something. I sometimes edit at night, though, then I can go down kind of a rabbit hole. If you're getting the sense that I don't have a really clear routine, (laughs) that is basically like make every effort to write in the morning unless that doesn't work, in which case find some other time later if possible. (laughs) open my computer late at night until I, you know, feel like I absolutely need to go to sleep and get stressed out about not getting enough sleep. So yeah, I, it's just sort of do as much as I can. If I get two hours of writing in a day, I'll be happy. Yeah. I mean, that (laughs) sounds familiar. (laughs) I always, I think Stephen King is the one who's like, I wake up and I sit down and I write what, like 5,000 words a day or something. And I sit until I finish that. And usually it's around noon. And then I like go for a long walk. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Well, 
it's it's really worked out for him but yeah um, I don't know yeah I don't know and and probably Ward does something like that too in this book but I don't know too many women who have that schedule the mm. I think Murakami writes from like 4 a.m to like 8 a.m or something and then really? yeah and I read that once I was like that's amazing I want to do that and I think I tried it once and I was like this doesn't work at all right <laughs> my brain is not aware yeah, no. <laughs> hmm, well uh anybody in the audience have questions yeah. Oh, Dave. <laughs> I like the comment about not being touched about writing. You're awfully talented. What? <laughs> this is my husband. <laughs> it was not a plan. Yes, I did. So I did grow up in New York and I, my parents um, had a house in Sag Harbor for a long time. So I did use very familiar settings. I, I kind of feel like I need to know a place really well before I write about it because otherwise it's just, um, I don't know. I don't think I would be able to make the reader feel like they were in that place. So even I actually had a scene where one of the characters is driving in the North Fork and that wasn't a place that I knew that well, but I thought I could. And then a copy editor was like, had a house there and was like, no, 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 you messed this up. It's the wrong route. It's the wrong whatever. <laughs> and I was like, really grateful, obviously, but also like, okay, this is why I need to like, really right so yeah I basically I will probably like stick to like New York and other places that I have <laughs> lived <laughs> luckily there's a lot going on in New York so yeah. right <laughs> yeah yeah. Also, thank goodness for copy editing. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I was like, oh, I'm grateful because you know that someone else would have been like, she definitely doesn't know what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. It was this, there was this, bro, this um, <laughs> giant duck that's on the side of the road in like near Riverhead. And I was trying to explain where it was. It's like, it might, it's like a museum, but it's also like a duck that you can like walk into and there's death, <laughs> of course, <laughs> as, as one does. And definitely there would have been a lot of people who's like, she doesn't know where the duck is. Like, I'm done with this book. Forget it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't trust anything else in this book. Anything else if she doesn't know where the giant duck is. So, yeah. yeah. I have a question from the Zoom that I can share. Yeah. So someone from our virtual audience wants to know, um, and you can both answer this, what's your favorite part of the novel writing process? I like editing much. Oh, I'm sorry. What was, what's the, our favorite part of the novel writing process? I much prefer editing to drafting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Um, although I will say my favorite part of drafting is just like the way beginning when you're walking around coming up and anything is possible and you're coming up with like all the fun ideas that you can possibly have and you don't have to be married to anything just yet. Mm. I love that part as well. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I want to like lock this down. Yeah. Let's like get this set. Like, I'm like that idea, this idea, like I get very overwhelmed. <laughs> so that's interesting. I, yeah, I don't, it feels like I want to like it, but then I always don't trust myself. Like, what if that's a bad idea? I don't know. Yeah. It's fair. Yeah. You yeah. could like go down one path and it could be the totally wrong path. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Re revising is so nice because like the book in some form exists and you yeah. kind of know who the characters are. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And you get to just make it better with the help of, you know, good feedback, hopefully good feedback. Right. Yeah. 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 So Lee, uh, you're a, a lawyer. You practiced law for several years here in Washington, where there are more lawyers than people. <laughs> yeah. 
How does being a lawyer impact you as a writer? Well, I definitely think that I learned to be a better and more succinct and like clear writer from being a lawyer. Um, so I think that's definitely been a benefit. And then um, I also think that I'm glad that I have this um, profession and personality type that I feel like I can write about authoritarian authoritatively because I've been in, in, in that profession. So, um, though I wrote a whole book about lawyers and was told that no one wanted to, read that, so. um, but yeah, it's more like you need just like a sprinkling of lawyers. So that's what I did in this book, just a sprinkle because one Brian is a lawyer and he's a U.S. attorney. So I felt like I could write about that and understand what that was. So that's just like one profession I don't have to research mm, when mm -hmm. I'm writing a book, <laughs> at least <laughs> not like as much as others. So that's a good, that's a good thing. Um, but yeah. Do you think all of your books going forward will have a lawyer in them somewhere? Um, no, maybe no, but, but it's a good one to be like, oh, well, what did this person do before, you know? well, we can make them a lawyer or that, yeah. you know, like it's sort of, or maybe they went to law school. Cause I could, I can, you know, write about that. So yeah. Yeah. And it's good. Like, you know, it, so all the lawyers in DC won't reach out complaining about how you got the details I mean, wrong. Might, and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd be very happy if all the lawyers in DC read the book. <laughs> Spread the word. Yeah. Anyone you see on the street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Our audience, um, which writers do you, this is for you, Lee, which writers do you especially admire or enjoy reading in addition to Laura Hendrick, of course? <laughs> of course. Yeah, I submitted um, that question <laughs> earlier. Um, well, I don't know if I could aspire to write like her, but the writer I always say that like I love the most and like get so excited about is Jenny Ophel who wrote a book called Department of Speculation, which is really good and everyone should read it. Um, I really love Lynn Steger Strong's books. Um, Flight is the most recent one. I just love her descriptions and her characters. I don't know that we write similarly, but I, I really enjoy her, her books a lot. What about you? Oh gosh, so many. Well, and I feel like it's it's interesting. I have the writers who I aspire to write, like mm -hmm. like a Taylor Jenkins Reid or a Curtis Sittenfeld, mm -hmm. um, and then I have the ones that I just totally admire, and yeah. I'm like, I will never be you, right? Yeah. Um, you know, recently Gabrielle Zevin, yeah, um, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, it's huge, yeah, yeah. No, I love that book and yeah. AJ Fickery, yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Any other Emily? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you for asking this because I meant to ask this and I forgot. But the question is, do we have favorite Nepo babies? My favorite Nepo baby is Laura Dern. Um, okay. who like, okay. So I feel like there are a lot of Nepo babies that we don't even realize are Nepo babies because clearly I'm passionate about this subject, um, because they've proved themselves. Um, right. yeah. Like Laura Dern, Drew Barrymore. Yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Um, Carrie Fisher. Oh yeah. It's a good, I mean, like, come on, <laughs> but she's a, she's a great Nepo baby. It's a great Nepo baby. Yeah. And I hold out hope for her daughter, Billy Lord. <laughs> yes. 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 Oh yeah. Yeah. And now maybe her daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Goes on and on. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, well, I have another question for you. Okay. Now that this book is out in the world, are you working on something new? 
I am, but it's very, it's still in the like, you know, part where I'm not exactly sure it's going to go, but it's going to be about um, a library, a private library in New York. And I think three women who go to this library for different reasons and, you know, have, you know, sort of inter interlocking stories. So that really tells very little, but that's sort of where mm, I am. A private library. A private library. Yes. Interesting. Oh, one thing in this book that I love, Isabel goes to this like co-working space for writers. Yes. Um, and well, it's a or, private library. It's a private, yeah. a private library. Um, and I have to say, I really latched onto that detail and was like, where can I do that in DC? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure there probably are this. Yeah. This one is on the Upper East Side and I mean, it's private, but for a pretty nominal fee you can join and go there yeah I was reading I was like oh that's a monthly that's a steal yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well anybody else or there aren't any other zoom questions well, someone did suggest you could try going to the library of congress <laughs> yeah. uh, Fair point they must suggested that <laughs> I'm just lazy, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Laura. Thank you all for being such an attentive and participatory audience and our friends on Zoom as well. Um, all of the copies that that you got from us via Eventbrite or that you buy in the store are already signed. That's true for Laura's books and for Lee's. Um, but if you would like to get them personalized, we can do that. If you haven't purchased a copy yet and you still need one, all of their books are upstairs waiting for you. We've got plenty. Um, and as we transition to that signing, we'll just ask if you're willing to help us by folding up your chair and placing it against the wall. That would be wonderful. I also just pulled out a copy of Lynn Seeger Strong's Flight and um, Jenny Offal's Department of Speculation, which I it, that's that's one of mine. I, every book I read, I want it to be. I mean, not everyone, but like if more could be just this taut and precise and lovely, it would be wonderful. Um, so thank you all. And please, please go buy some books. Thank you for being with us.